Hey, this is Steve Bloom, and you are listening to the GeekCast Radio Network. You better go talk to him, find out why he's moving from the minus to the majors. Ah, oh, god damn it, what now? There is nothing wrong with your podcast player. Do not attempt to adjust the volume. Hello and welcome back into our studio. You are now inside Studio 2009, only on the GeekCast Radio Network. I am, of course, J.F. Joe and Mike. And joining me once again is Ryan, the uneven Flo Merkley. Hello, sir. Hello. And we are here to do the second part of seven in our 20th anniversary celebration of FX's The Shield. So we're going to talk about season two tonight, today, whenever you find people are listening to this. Amadeo burns out his competition, sends me a message. Me and my boys will handle this one. Hey, I'm just giving you information. This is my case. You see that little piggy with my card spiked to its head? This is gangland. It's my domain. I'm already on it. Any reason why the two of you shouldn't pair up together? I just think it would make more sense if I handled this on my own. You're going to see some kind of kicking and screaming you didn't know existed. You try pulling me off this. You both want it. It's big enough for the two of you. Work it together. Fine. Great. Season two. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I like it more than I thought I did. Uh, as in like, back when, sorry, uh, there's a bunch of different events that this season follows coming out of season one. The mm -hmm. most notable, Vix lost his family, which, oh man, they're better off without him. But that's a totally other story. Uh, yep. Vix lost his family. Vic has sort of... They've kind of, well, actually, everybody's kind of lost control of the barn. So they have an independent auditor coming in to find corruption, which, of course, there's none in the barn. None at all. Uh, <laughs> pretty much everybody's corrupt. Anywho, uh, on top of that, we've got the stuff going on on the street in terms of the sort of drug war, which is kind of the main focus of the season. Yeah. And there's what I thought was the main focus of the season because. For whatever reason, looking back at it, I could have sworn that the money train was just something that was in the entire season from start to finish, when it's not. I was surprised that it only kind of first gets mentioned uh, roughly halfway in. And yeah. I don't know what it was. For whatever reason, yeah, I thought it was just the entire thing. And yeah, it wasn't. Uh, and then we'd still have some stuff for... The other, actually, the other characters go through a fair amount, as in like Julian and Danny and everybody. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I originally thought the money train was the tail end of season two going into season three. You were closer I, than I was then, because, yeah, for whatever reason, <laughs> like I say. Yeah, I thought, no, I was like, like, I remember the money train. I remember them stealing the money train. I remember them, you know, I mean, if uh, if Julian was full time on the strike team, I guess he could be the Wesley Snipes, and I guess Shane could be the Woody Harrelson of the money. Oh wait, that's whoops, wrong, wrong universe. That's a movie, not a not a show. Anyway, <laughs> also this is the season where Shane uh, debuts the Cletus Van Dam uh, persona. Yep. So he's apparently more Jean Claude Van Dam redneck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This season. So I was uncomfortable watching the first season because of how, you know, you can listen to episode 36, folks, and you'll, and, and you'll hear my, my explanations for that if you listen to that. But, like, this season I was like, okay, what's going on with them? And, okay, what's going on with Vic and the fat? Like, I mean, yes, Vic is a bad guy. But seeing the whole family thing with him – and him just not being able to deal with it. Again, we, we said in that episode, we'll say it in this episode, we'll probably say it in the next, you know, five episodes. At times, you want to sympathize with Vic, even though you know you shouldn't. 
I think the other issue is you want to root for him sometimes too. So most notably in this season, we have Vic team up with Wims and Wagenbach. He raped a 12 year old girl last night to cover the tire murders. Hey, he raped a kid? Why is he in Central by now? Her brother's uncooperative. I think he took her back to Mexico. No victim, no arrest. And they're trying to find a child that's missing. Mm -hmm. And he, and this is the second last, so we're jumping ahead a little, but whatever. This is the second last episode of the season, but, and he's working with them and he's still kind of doing his, uh, not so good cop stuff. Although he tones it down because he's working with Claudette, uh, but still he's not doing everything, you know, inside the lines necessarily, but because of the situation you're rooting for him. And it's one of the things the show did a really good job with is that there is, I think Sean Ryan was the one that said this and he said this sometime right around the time the show ended that Vic's a bad person and he's a bad cop, Mm -hmm. but secretly deep down, we all kind of wish that there might be a Vic Mackey looking out or that, you know, you kind of wish that person could exist. Mm-hmm. And I, th- you know, it comes out, especially in cases involving kids and yeah, it comes out in real life too, for people, I think. And I don't know. It's yeah, it no, you're a right. lot of stuff with the Punisher in that part of making the character work is coming up with people that are so bad. Even this monster seems kind of okay, at least for a second. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Vic is, uh, so the stuff with his family, I don't remember how I felt when I watched it originally, but now obviously, and again, we mentioned this in the first part, I know what happens. So in the first couple episodes, when Vic finds his family again, and by the end, Spoiler alert, uh, he files for divorce trying to preemptively get some sort of visitation with the kids, Mm -hmm. but, uh, he's just, he's, he's not a good family guy. He's (laughs) not a good family man. No, there's sort of a thing to him, especially by the end of the series. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's. He wants to do, I think he wants to do the right thing for his family for the most part, but the hard ass reputation of the cop that he is kind of interferes with that. I have a hard time figuring out if he cares about them. He cheats on Corinne all the time. He Mm -hmm. isn't home with the kids, one of which actually, yeah, aren't they all? I can't remember now. We so this I, this don't, time. I don't think, I don't think Cassidy is autistic, but both Matthew and Megan are. Yeah, autistic. I think it's, yeah, two out of three. That's right. No, yep. no. Yeah. We went through this last time. And, uh, so anyway, he, he you know, he's not, uh, <laughs> he's not a good dad <laughs> to them either. And he's an no. awful husband. And, yeah. He at best is emotionally distant, and yeah, I think, I think it's just a thing for him, and it gets worse as the series goes on because he loses the group that really is his family. Yeah, through his own actions, and in the oh end, yeah, absolutely, and in yeah. the end, he pushes away his actual family again through his own actions. So mm-hmm. this season kind of feels like the. No, he was bad in season one, too. Well, I, it's just the continuation of it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, so, all right. From even, like I mentioned in episode 36, it took me until that rewatch when we did that episode to realize that we see how Vic knew that Terry was the rat, the mole, the whatever at the time. Yeah. You know, cause it's, it goes into whatever in the, you know, all that. But 
From that first action, from him shooting Terry Crowley, Vic's not a good guy. Vic is a... He's... Yeah, but the show does a decent job of making you forget it. Well, because you have these moments like him, you know, him coming home and the family isn't there. And he, you know, hears this answering machine from his future ex-wife saying, hey, don't try to find us. Don't this, don't that. And you see the emotions on his face and you see him breaking down. And as a viewer of television, you kind of want to root for him in that specific moment. Well, I also think on the cop side of it too, though. So to get into this a little more. So first of all, Mm -hmm. the early part of the season, uh, poor Tio has a real rough time. Uh, gets, (laughs) you know, gets his HQ burned down. Some of his people get killed and then, you know, he gets beaten to death. Uh, so, uh, we learned that somebody worse has moved in and that's the other part of it. So in terms of the cop aspect of Vic, Mm -hmm. He is, their methods stink and their methods are corrupt, but the insinuation is that somehow it's protecting the streets and the people from worse people moving in. His deals with Tio, his deal in season one with uh, pretty much everybody. (laughs) Rondell. Um, Yeah. Yeah, especially Rondell, but... Yeah, you know, he turns on him for real. Whatever. In any case, he yeah, he thinks we think he's protecting them. He's really not. And in the end, each time somebody worse keeps showing up. But yeah. you want to root for him because it seems like he's protecting them. And then in this one, he rescues the child. Hell, in what was it, in the premiere of the series, he gets a confession from a, a pedophile by. Yep. Beating him. And, yep. you know, there's all these things that it's terrible, but deep down, I think the lizard brain part of us goes, yeah, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. It's. And it, by the way, it's helped to, so Chickless, and I think we talked about mm-hmm. this a little in the first one, but uh, he does not get, I know he won the Emmys, but he does not get enough credit for this for his work in this no. show. And in a lot of ways, he is Walter White well before Walter White. And yeah. he has a natural charisma to him. Mm-hmm. It reminds me a lot of, if someday we ever talk about it, of David Tennant and his work as Kilgrave Purple Man in Jessica Jones that yep. he's so slimy and disgusting, but you kind of forget because you go like, eh, it's David Tennant. He's a nice guy. <laughs> and Chickless has that because I think a lot of people remember him as the commish. And yeah. he was kind of a bumbling, like friendly guy who still got the job done. So I think that's yep. part of it. And I do think Chickless himself has a real strong I've noticed in everything he's done since then, too, he's yeah. he's very charismatic. And that certainly yeah. helps a lot. If they had picked somebody who is unlikable as an actor or as a person, I think the show would have fallen flat on its face. But alternatively, the work he puts in is he's so good in this. He's this is a really good cast. And we talked about it in the first time, a bunch of different people kind of broke out from this show. Yeah. Uh, but really until we hit the later seasons and we've mentioned some of the guest stars that show up, he's yep. still so head and shoulders above everybody. Yeah. And he's so good. And it's not a slight against anybody else. We've, we've both mentioned it a hundred times that we absolutely adore CCH pounder. You know, yeah, she is Amanda Waller for me, no matter what they yep. ever do anywhere else. Yep. And she's so many other characters. Uh, but yeah. And Claudette gets so good. It's like, it's like Claudette was great in season one. Here. They, yeah. And she's a yeah. central character here with the will she or won't she in terms of taking over the barn as yep. uh, captain. As the captain S of eight is. Job Public service, and his, yeah. yeah. As his job is seemingly winding down, and we get a lot of where he stands in the polls in terms of moving up, 
yeah. as a politician. And by the end, of course, yeah, he, you know, gets, he wins, he gets to move on. And so we need a new captain. Yep. Uh, it will not be, <laughs> spoiler alert, it will not be Claudette. Uh, no, no, it won't be. But, but that's, yeah, that's, that's okay. I don't mind. Because initially she didn't want, like she told him, like. No, but I'm she, a detect- but she know, needed but, to be and she should have yeah. been. Yeah. No, absolutely. Because You're was, right. Because she was one of the only people that could mm-hmm. actually clean things up. And it should be noted that it some of the stuff that were so in this season, more stuff that Vic is just not a good dude. And the strike team doesn't uh-huh. care about people. Not only do they damage Claudette, although that's mostly in the next season, Yeah, you know, Vic and the strike teams shenanigans destroy her career partially, but in this yep. season directly, they destroy Danny's. I mean, officer so for, she has, a, yeah. she has a rough go. So she's, she has to, She's forced into a scenario where she shoots and kills a man yep. and is continuously harassed by the wife. Yep. And then as if that's not bad enough, uh, well, you know what? We'll, we should talk about Armadillo first, so, I guess, before we get to that. So, yeah. Yeah. We got to talk about Armadillo and we got to talk about Tio because – and I want to start with Tio really quick because I'm looking at the actor Cedric Pendleton. I'm looking at his IMDb because I'm I'm like that's the one thing with this show. I said it last season with Benito Martinez with with, with as the guy who plays Aceveda. This show has so many people that I look at and I'm like I know that person from somewhere. I don't know where I know him from, but I think I know him from something. Obviously, with Walter Emmanuel Jones, with with Rondell, Rondell used to be a Power Ranger in the '90s, kind of thing. And Cedric Pendleton here is kind of you know Tio was kind of the same thing. And I've got his IMDb pulled up. You don't want to know what the first thing he did for a TV series was? What? <laughs> 1999, he was on WCW Worldwide as Looney. Whoever the hell Looney was, Hmm. he was in that. He was in uh, Summer Catch as one of the baseball players. It's a movie from 2001. Uh, uh, No, he was the closer. He was the the closing pitcher, Calvin Knight. I remember that now. Obviously, The Shield. Uh, he was on an episode of NYPD Blue. He was on CSI in New York. Uh, you know, but he's been in House of Pain. He was on the Have Nots. But again, it's one of those things where he's one of those guys that I'm like, where have I seen him before? And I mean, Armadillo. Huh. Once I recognized him from the accent and through the weird mustache and what I'm like, hey, that's Danny Pino. Holy crap. (laughs) So Danny, uh, who plays Armadillo, originally I knew him as Scotty Valens on Cold Case. He played, he also played Nick Amaro from 2011 to 2021 on Law & Order SVU. So those are their actors, but the characters of these two individuals, wow. That's a little different. Yeah, that's very different. (laughs) But Tio is Vic's current sort of drug dealer of choice, I guess we'll say. Yeah. Uh, And they're backing him. Tio is killed by Armadillo fairly early on, uh, in like first two episodes. Yep. Uh, and at that point, Armadillo kind of takes over the drug trade. Armadillo is not a good person. No, not at all. He is a criminal. And He's a very sick individual. Yeah, you know, he criminal, is so. awful. He does things worse than killing his own brother when the strike team threatened to <laughs> out him. Yep. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so the strike team, this is the season two that gives... Ronnie 
at least a little something to do, although most of it is getting his face burned off in retaliation for oh, them burning Aceveda, or Aceveda, them burning Armadillo's face. So that's the thing with this with, with this uh, season is that this main overall bad guy Armadillo Quintero, played by uh, uh, I almost said Nick Amor, played by Danny Pino, his signature way of getting rid of people is that he likes to burn them up and Vic finds out about this and whatever. And Vic catches him in a house and Vic's like, okay, you want to burn people here? Let's get you burned. And it wasn't until the episode after that happened that I finally recognized who, you know, who the actor was at the time because I saw, you know, parts of his face and whatever else. So, yeah, he gets burned up and then obviously, you know, retribution. So Ronnie sadly gets burned up. Hey, at least Ronnie isn't just the driver anymore. At yeah. least Ronnie is kind of moving into his tech phase. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he had something to do finally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, wow. So that happens. And this is like within like the first five or six episodes. I mean, this isn't even like, yeah, that's the thing with this season. I the first eight episodes, I was like, hmm. Each time, like, okay, this is happening. This is happening. This is happening. But look at this. He was making monthly payments to a landlord when he owns the building. Well, maybe Armadillo's the landlord. Tio got tired of shelling out. I was a payback. Black dealer, Latino boss man. I doubt it. Besides. He was making payments weeks before Amadeo crossed the border. Oh. Mackie's got all these women on the side and whatever else. And, you know. So, yeah, the first eight episodes was just like, holy crap. They went by a lot faster than I thought. They yeah, Armadillo dies. Uh, yep. So, spoiler alert again. I mean, they kill Armadillo. Uh, he dies. Obviously. Uh, yep. A lot earlier than I remember. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he does. I mean, I yeah. thought for whatever reason, I, I don't know why, because I did remember that the team was there, but for whatever reason, I seemed to recall that in my brain that that was why Vic missed the money train heist. It wasn't. No. Yeah. It was something <laughs> completely different. Um, so oops. Anywho. Yeah. Uh, that's what so time does to you. Everything kind of jumps together. Melds together. So, it should be noted, uh, Armadillo. So Armadillo is well aware of Tio's relationship with the strike team. Mm-hmm. And this yeah. is why they can't just kind of go out and outright murder the guy, which they would probably normally do. However, they need to get rid of him. And things get worse for the strike team when Armadillo gives himself up to the police and yeah. gets put into custody. Yeah, uh, and this is where I mentioned. So, Danny, we went over the early part of the season with her. Yep. And well, <laughs> in a frankly pretty smart maneuver, uh, the team gives a makes a deal with another person that they're that's arrested. They mm-hmm. give him a knife. Unfortunately, it's a perp that is first by Danny. So she gets blamed for this, by the way. But they give yeah. him a knife, and he knifes Armadillo to death in this, the pen. Mm-hmm. And he bleeds out there, and all the strike team's problems are temporarily solved until they create new ones for themselves. Yes. <laughs> so the reason why I keep mentioning this, the first eight episodes of this is because that was the mid season. I, I want to say, well, maybe not. Well, here it, it felt like a mid. So it's with scar tissue. When Mackie discovers that Gardaki has been burned as payback and the rest of the team does everything they can, blah, 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 to put an end to Armadillo, you know? So that episode, when, when I was watching this, I was like, okay, so the Armadillo thing is continuing. Okay, okay, okay. I get to the next episode, which is episode nine, yeah, entitled Co-Pilot, Co-Pilot, which is a weird, 
Yeah, I was going to get to that it, at the end. Yeah, so, the, oh, okay, well, I didn't realize you were going to get no, to no, that at the fine. end. Yeah, but, I'm just kind of, I mean, as we continue on the overall kind of plot, right, right. I guess. Yeah. And I'll bring okay. this up at the end, because, yeah, it's a little odd. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One thing we haven't gotten to, and, and this becomes much larger in the last, uh, well, four episodes, sorry, 10 to 13, is Julian. Uh, Julian Lowe is gay, and he has started really figuring that out, essentially. Yep. And in this season, he gets harassed. He ends the season uh, being beaten severely. Yes. I don't... I feel like it's weird. I feel like it's handled... I mean, it's handled, unfortunately, in a potentially realistic manner, Mm -hmm. especially for 2003. Yeah. Which sucks. (laughs) Yeah. Um... And then, uh, and then it f- kind of further gets complicated with the actor, but that's a whole other story. I yeah. don't want to talk about ever again. So. No, no. Uh, hey, look, he, Michael Jace, the actor, is is not somebody I'm going to be singing any praises at all. The char- I will talk about the character of Julian and what he goes through in this series, but as far as Michael the actor doesn't exist. Him, yeah. He's, no, uh, yeah. he's like, pretty much no. erased from the old history for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. If there's a reunion, he will not be part of it. <laughs> there was a reunion and I don't know if he was a part of it, part of it or not. There was a reunion in 2018. I watched it on YouTube. I'll have to send it to you. God damn it. But anyway, anyway. <laughs> Why did that not come up when I was watching? Whatever. Anywho, that's another story. So there's his storyline, and then I mentioned it before. The bulk of the last few episodes is the independent auditor report and everything coming down on the barn, and mm-hmm. that threatens Aceveda, who makes a deal with Vic. Next of all is. I mentioned the stuff with Julian. And then lastly, the other really big part of it is the money train. So there's an Armonian or Armonian. (laughs) They wear wear really nice suits. Uh, There's the Armenian money train and they just, uh, it's a random placement. They move, use it to move money around and Mm -hmm. the strike team wants to hit it so they can essentially retire. Yeah. And they do the end. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you know, it, it's – so they have the retirement fund that they have and all the shit that keeps coming up in all of their lives, whether it's Ronnie's face being burned or Shane being a stupid idiot or uh, Lem. his family will, uh, excitement. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the so <sighs> I know in real life cops, whether they are – beat cops or detectives or whatever they do ha- you know they do side work they do you know security work and things like that sometimes to make up extra cash because being a police person is not you know it, it isn't the richest job in the world it's a public service job and and all that but what Vic and the team do to pad their pockets and have their retirement fund. The way they explain it in the show is that it's the Armenian mob's money, their entire West Coast distribution of cash going all the way up from Seattle, Washington, all the way down to San Diego and into Mexico and whatever, whatever, the whole West Coast. And it's like, holy crap. And they get it done somehow, sort of, kind of, almost. But they do it. I like the fallout of the money train as far as how they have to be careful and how, obviously, Shane's going to be dumb. But I'm... So... (laughs) I'm... Overall, so far, okay with the character of Shane Vendrell. 
but I'm not a super fan of him. So his yeah, his paranoia and that kind of thing hasn't started to go out of control or anything yet. That's something that happens later on. Here yeah. we kind of don't know him. He's not a good guy, obviously. Yeah. Uh he and Vic are easily, I think, the worst of the team. Uh oh easily, and, yeah. And especially at this point, in terms of yeah. like as human beings. Yeah. Uh we haven't really quote unquote gone home with Shane or anything to kind of learn a lot about him. It's only uh, yeah, later on. We will. But yeah. yeah, all we know is he's not a super great cop or a super good dude. He's kind of a goofy yeah. doesn't care. He's he's kind of like like and I, I don't want to I, I hate that I'm making this comparison, but I'm going to make it. It's like Vic is the Lone Ranger and Shane is Tonto. You know Lone Ranger say, Tonto, no go to town. What does Tonto do? Tonto goes to town and gets beat up by the bandits. Like, Shane does the stupidest, dumbest, like, he's not careful. He's not this, that, and that whole, what we'll get into later in, you know, season three, four, whatever, the Cletus Van Damme bullshit. Well, and, yeah, oh, he's open with that here, but yeah. Yeah, but like all of that, and then finding that hmm. he's season one and two, Jesse Pinkman, kind of, <laughs> kind of. Except he, I have to say, season one and two, Jesse has much better quotes than Shane well, does. Yeah, he's funnier. But, <laughs> well, also, their character arc is the exact opposite. Jesse kind of gets tries to be more moral mm -hmm. and Shane just kind of goes further and further down the toilet. Yeah. Oh, Shane's going down the toilet throughout this entire until, you know, whatever, like But right now he seems it yeah. seems normal. Like right now the strike team is everybody's getting along, they're all working together, yeah. everyone's on the same page about the money train to the point yeah. that they hit it while Vic yeah. is not there. Yeah, and the only one even at this point when they're discussing the money train that has reservations about it is Lem. You yep. because Lem is by far out of the four of them. I mean He's Ronnie the too. Least evil. But, well Ronnie yeah, we just, I, yeah. Ronnie we just don't know yet. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, until later on we kind of learn we finally learn more about Ronnie yeah. essentially in the last season. And that's Sort of it. Yeah. It also helps. I mean, Ronnie was gone for a portion of this season as he recovers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and did they? No, that was the third. I've I've already watched ahead, folks, because I just <laughs> I got I got caught up. I got to the point where I was Lem like hasn't literally anything. Uh, Lem, anyway, e e yes, but like when we were going to record this, I watched the. Second season, and then that season finale, I was like, okay, click next. Oh, this is where we're starting. Okay. So, like, I'm in the middle of season four right now. <laughs> like, I could not – I just can't – it's so <sighs> – a lot of the characters are bad, and you don't want to root for them, specifically the strike team. And there is another character that – I don't see him getting any better, but uh, here too, I'd argue, I don't know. Danny doesn't seem like a great officer in this season. I mean, despite being set up by, I mean, she doesn't seem to be, she's not corrupt. She's just, she's not, the, no, She's not corrupt, but at the same time, she's not. She's a seasoned officer who doesn't know where she is. Like, yes, she is okay being a patrol officer. I believe at one point or another, Aceveda mentions to her in this season about the detective's test or something. Yep. And she did or didn't take it or whatever. And then Dutch and, oh, I can help you study or whatever. Maybe that was the season. But the point is, is that she hasn't moved up yeah, in Dutch, rank. Dutch kind of starts hitting it on her on this season. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, By the way, Dutch's complete love life failure is a uh, fun kind of thing that 
that happens through the series. Uh, <sighs> yeah, Dutch, I as bad as Vic and the strike team are, so far, yeah. Dutch is my least favorite character out of that's, all of the characters. I'd argue that's on. later, but that's something we'll talk about later. Yeah, but, so, Right, but what I'm saying is, like, Dutch... I felt creepy about Dutch the first time I watched the pilot when we first were going to do this. And I had not watched this show in 20 years. So, like the last time I saw this show was 2002. It's something, so, yeah, it's something we'll get into uh, much yeah. later with certain events, especially one in particular that I think it's really interesting that Michael Chiklis – uh, was absolutely dead set against. He was dead set against a f- couple things with with Dutch. I think he thought he was a little too creepy too. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Anywho, um, back to this season. So <laughs> the season I mentioned it ends. Danny loses her job. Julian is beaten for being gay. Aceveda wins and becomes is now a politician. Claudette is yep. in sort of a, she oversees the barn. She is not the captain. She's a supervisor is yeah. essentially where it ends. The strike team hits the money train. And I think that's where everybody, well, yeah. And Dutch is still a detective there. <laughs> that's yeah. That's where everybody I mean, winds up. Uh, yeah. I mean, I forgot that Danny lost her job. I remembered that uh, Julian got beat to high hell, but I did not remember that Danny lost her job. And I remember why, obviously, you know, because of her shooting the the armed or unarmed person or whatever in his whole. What I didn't remember today, about that was today, nowadays would be you know ten minutes at your desk, and then that's fine. Oh, anyway. Uh, um, anywho, I. I had forgotten that she was involved in the Armadillo storyline. Yeah. No, I know that's what you're going to say. I had forgotten about that too. And that's ultimately why she loses her job. Yeah. The last straw. Yep. And then we have co-pilot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is exactly, you beat me to it. What I was going to do. Ninth (laughs) episode. Sorry. Can I help you? I'm Detective Mackey. I'm running the strike team. We're still interviewing for that position. (laughs) I hope not. Assistant Chief Gilroy told me I start tomorrow. I figured I'd settle in early, hit the ground running. Gilroy told you that. I'm Captain David Acevedo. Said your name was Mackey, right? Yeah. I read your file. We have a chance to do something real special here. Well, you let me know how I can help. Ninth episode of the season, 22nd episode of the series, and it splits up the Armadillo storyline into Mm -hmm. the Money Train storyline. Yeah. Why? (laughs) So what it is, is it's an addendum to the pilot of the series. Mm-hmm. It happens before then. And it's yep. everybody's, it's the first day of the barn and it's Claudette and Dutch working together for the first time. It's Aceveda becoming captain of the barn. It's the first day for the strike team. Uh, yep. It's not a bad episode. It just doesn't no. remotely belong here. I don't know where I would actually put it. That's the thing. So when I just look back, the pilot, the very first, the the series premiere takes place 18 months 
into the Farmington thing. So they had already been there for a year and a half. A year and a half. Mm. This has flashbacks to the very first day where everybody gets set up and everybody this and everybody that. And, and I like this. I just, it's was a good episode, really con- but it's weird yeah. placement. And I'm looking at C. Se- I'm okay. So I'm looking at season one where you end it with circles, which is, you know, the season one ender. You start with the quick fix while Mackie searches for his wife and children, blah, 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 blah. Dead soldiers, partners, carte blanche, greenlit. Let me see here. So between five and six, greenlit, Acevedo works with Mackie and the strike team to take down a dealer, giving her to school kids. Uh, Home Wrecker, which is episode six of season two, Wagenbach, Wacky, Wacky, wow, Wagenbach, <laughs> Mackie, and Whims investigate a massacre of women's shelter. Yeah, which, and which, to be, works. which to be fair, that one is. So I don't want to say it's it's a little. I don't know. It feels out of place. To mm-hmm. a certain extent, it's a weird one as well. It doesn't. There's yeah. just not as much in terms of the overall arc, be it Armadillo, and this is before yeah. the money train. And I think, yeah, I think episodes like that and Copilot are why I thought the money train was more of a central theme to the entire season. Is that so I think if go ahead, sorry, I was just thought, saying like sorry. Homewrecker feels a little bit like the spread in that it's kind of a, it's a bit of a throwaway episode in terms of the entire season as a whole. Uh, But then you have co-pilot, which is just, it's a gigantic (laughs) throwaway episode that I think it's a solid episode again, but I don't feel like we learn anything about any of the characters that we didn't already know. Yeah. I, I, like it's, I it's don't, kind of fun to see it, but I don't yeah. feel like we need it. It didn't feel necessary. And it's weird I, in, a, in what was a pretty tight season. Yeah. I think... Okay, so I'm just looking back at the spread. Sweep day with all outstanding Yeah, the spread is the season about. one episode. Well, right. Yeah, the, season three, yeah. No, so I'm looking back at that. It was the third episode of the to, series. Right, right, right. So I'm trying to see between episode, okay, episode four of season two is carte blanche, which is now Mackie is back to work and he and Vendrell go undercover to the cops to find man behind robbery, murder, wagabout, whims, track down an old rival of whims's after turn. So I think co-pilot could fit in between Homewrecker and Barnstormers. So between six and seven. Homewrecker, I disagree. It is, it's not a bad episode. It's not bad as the spread is. No. But Homewrecker shows us, you know, and that's one thing I, I meant to mention when we're doing season one. One thing I've noticed so far as I've been watching the series again is how different each episode starts. Sometimes we start with the detective. Sometimes we start with the patrol officer. Sometimes we start with the strike team. Sometimes we start with Aceveda and whatever. I like that because it's showing you different aspects of the, the barn of, of the department that they all work together. And I think if you put co-pilot up there between after home record, but before barnstormers, it might be okay. I just was shocked because I did not remember co-pilot again. I haven't seen the show in 20 years, so I did not remember that they did this. And I love that they did this. Hmm. Really? Yeah. Right. I dug this. I dug co-pilot because I mean, I think first it's a fine episode. I just think the placement is. Uh, yeah, no, the placement is is bad. But overall, though, the episode itself. Oh man, I love the episode. Well, well for context, uh, it is the second worst rated episode of the entire series. So 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> what's the word? I'm going to ask now in season two, what is the worst rated oh, episode? What's the worst ever rated episode of season two by quite a bit? Okay. No, it's, oh. it's uh, season four uh, oh, has boy. the only two episodes, and they're actually in a row that are low, that are rated lower, and they both have the same rating. Oh, no. And it sort of makes sense. I don't know. Season, anyway, that's a season that's four. A whole other season. Yes, it's a whole two seasons away. <laughs> but yeah, season, yeah, I don't know. Season two is generally seems well regarded. And then, yeah, the co pilot is just kind of, it's just kind of there. Let me put it this way. So I'm going by IMDb, mm-hmm. and co pilot has a 7.5. Every okay. other episode of the season is eight or higher. Okay. Wow. So it's a fairly, a, there's a decent kind of split there. And I think I, I'm i not going to sit here and read all the reviews for everybody. Uh, Obviously. As much fun as that would be for me and everyone else. But Okay, let me ask you this. But no, I just think it's the placement. I really think oh. that's why. It, it just, it breaks up what is a pretty tightly paced season mm. all together that tells a really coherent story. Right. And okay, so le- let me ask you this then. Mm-hmm. You take episode nine, you take co-pilot, you move it down, you move it after Domino's falling. So co-pilot would essentially be the season finale. No, so you have bad idea. I said this before that I don't know where I would put it. I think in the end, even though it's a good episode, it doesn't do mm-hmm. enough to justify its existence. Hmm. I I think if you so just to look ahead, folks, since we're, we end up Uh-oh. doing that anyway half the time in season three, you're just happy to see I, Rondell and Terry back for the episode. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. So in season three, the first episode of season three is playing tight. The strike team attempt to play by the book and come to an abrupt and their attempts to play by the book comes to an abrupt end when they discover that two gangs, the Bizlats and the one niners are attempting to alter the balance of power. So my thinking is if you put Copilot after Domino's falling as the season finale of two, it kind of like you have your full story of season two and then you have this little asterisk at the bottom of, hey, here's your full story of of uh, Armadillo and Tio and the money train and all that stuff. But you also have, at the end, here's the beginning. I think if you were to shift it after playing tight into season three, that would work better. Because there's a definite Hmm. break between playing tight and then the next episodes. Because playing tight is literally sort of the fallout, the immediate fallout of... Of Domino's falling, yeah. Yeah, because Vic's trying to stomp an arms war, essentially... But yeah. nobody knows that the arms wars because of what just happened right. with the money train. I think. If okay, you, I so think if you have the yeah. break there, it would have worked better. I don't know. I'm not a. That's fine. I'm playing. Works for you know, me. I'm playing hindsight too, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's nothing we can do about it no. now. I, you know, but because I was like, because literally, as soon as I, as soon as, so when I watched my episode, when I watched the episodes on Hulu. I watched Scar Tissue, episode eight of season two. And at the end of Scar Tissue, I was like, okay, next episode. Next episode, I get immediate flashbacks to an empty church with all these desks and whatever. And I forgot the barn used to be a church. I completely forgot that. Didn't even remember it from season one when we just did our episode a few few weeks ago, a few months ago, whatever it was. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> I was completely shocked with with Copilot, but once I realized what it was, I'm like, oh, hmm, this is really cool. This is really interesting. And, you know, twenty years later, in hindsight, you know, 
we can try to fit it wherever we want to, but it is where it is. Uh, overall, season two, it's still really good. I, yeah, yeah, very good. What the hell did I give season one? <laughs> oh, did I give it I, like I a high we, three and a half? Yeah, season two I, was some, better than I thought. So yeah, I would be giving it a four out of five. Uh, like season one, I think it's a high four. It was easy, wasn't it? Yeah. A little too easy. Yeah, I'm right there with you. It's a high four. Uh, there are still plenty of things that, you know, make us feel uncomfortable and things like that, and there are going to be plenty. Of, and honestly, I think this show was made for that. Like, you're not going to – regardless of what has happened in the last 20 years in real life – I mean, this show is not... What was the intention, too? Like, Sean Ryan said that a few times, yeah. that he wanted a character that's not very likable, yeah. but he needed somebody who... Uh, it's funny, because they they weren't going to cast Chickless, yep. uh, which is really weird, because in the end, he is exactly what they needed, which was somebody charismatic enough that you could forget some of the awful stuff he does. Uh, and that's yeah. exactly what they wanted. It's just for whatever reason, actually it was mostly the look. Yeah. Yeah. It's mostly the look. I mean, you put, you put sunglasses, you know, we put a black pair of sunglasses on that bald guy. He's going to look like a badass, and he does. Well, he had, yeah, he had come in and that's what I don't get. I don't know. I guess I just don't know what he wanted. I know he, in the interviews before the sh- or about the start of the show, they were looking for like a Harrison Ford esque character, and so maybe yeah. that was the look he wanted. But in the end, I feel like Chickless was exactly the look and the everything he could have wanted. That's why I don't get that initially they passed on him because of the look, yep. and then they kind of went back to him. Uh, yeah. It's I don't know. It's just one of those things that uh, everything in the end turned out the way it should have. But it's a little weird yeah. that it took a bit to get there. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Ooh, right. Hmm. So I'm looking into Michael Chiklis because I I know the guy. We I mean I don't know the guy, but I mean I know of his <laughs> you know his acting He's and whatever. Friend, and I, yeah. and uh, <laughs> I you know I wish that'd be cool. Kind of cool actually. Just to say, hey, I know Michael Chiklis. Um, but I'm looking into what he's done or doing currently. Yeah, we talked about this last time though too. He's did we? Yes, we definitely went into his. Uh, frankly, I know we went into frankly astounding yeah. and extremely impressive resume. Yeah, I mean, yes, but like I, I've noticed recently him talking about on social media about what he's doing now, uh, you know, and two things come up, and because I saw him tweet the other day about Accused, which apparently is going to be a 2023 television series he is currently filming. He is supposed to be the role of Dr. Scott Corbett. But this other series, Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. He plays Red Arbach, the <laughs> coach of the Boston Celtics. Huh. <laughs> I now have to watch this show because... Huh. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but, uh, but yeah, the shield season two, very good. Very well done. Like, like Ryan said, kind of high fours all around. And yeah, I mean, this show, it just keeps getting better and I don't want to say better. It keeps, no, it does. It keeps I you mean, on I your think toes. It gets better. And that's, yeah. that's also partially why the first stuff's kind of lower. I need some yeah. place to go. <laughs> yeah. Like season <laughs> Five in yep. particular is really tough because mm-hmm. I need to be able to go up for yeah. That's yeah. Uh, anywho. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we only have a zero to five scale here around here, but you know, you can use half points if you want. So technically, we have a zero to ten, but it is zero to five. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I only remembered certain things about season two. And then I watched it, and then I was like, oh, right, that's when that happened. 
like you were saying, with the money training with Armadillo and Tio and all this and all that. And yeah, season three is going to be interesting. I don't know when we're going to do our season three episode. Might be sooner than we think, folks, because like I said, I'm in the middle of season four. And holy crap, season two of The Shield, 20 years. Damn. I forgot what was on television in 2003. Like, seriously, I do not remember (laughs) what was on TV in 2003 besides this show. (laughs) Oh, yeah, 19 years ago, though. It's nuts. Yeah, well, okay. Yes. I mean, No, I know. I'm just saying, like, in general, it's nuts that it's been that long. Yeah, we mentioned it first time, and actually... Uh, Chickless liked the tweet about that. The how has it been twenty years? Yep. Yeah, and I will. I will be mentioning him in every tweet that we do when we publish an episode for this. So you know, hey. Ultimately, I'd love to get him on here for an interview. Really, I mean, just to talk to him about his career and how he approaches acting and that kind of thing, and just go through his entire timeline, kind of thing. I think that'd be really cool. So I think that's going to do it for us here inside the studio. We are probably going to take a quick break. You're going to hear some ads and some other stuff, and we'll come back to close the show after this. The chief wants me out making cases, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I give you an order. You're a goddamn lame duck. An order you'll goddamn follow. Or what? You recommend that I'm fired? Been nice knowing you. Hello, geeks and geekettes! Looking for a podcast that covers a vast array of topics? Then check out Altered Geek Unleashed, where we discuss our thoughts on this week's geeky news, tech, gaming, television shows, movies, cartoons, comics, and more. So, get altered, get geeky with the Altered Geeks, every Friday on the GeekCast Radio Network. Like science fiction? Of course you do, or you wouldn't be listening to the GeekCast Radio Network. Well, the Mark Who 42 Universe podcast is an award-winning sci-fi radio show that's been around for over 10 years. We cover everything from Doctor Who to the MCU to pop culture and everything in between. A new show drops on Tuesday mornings on the GCRN website and all of the major podcast platforms. So listen to the Mark Who 42 Universe podcast from the universe and beyond. Because the world needs another movie podcast. The GeekCast Radio Network presents for your listening pleasure, The Cinema Geek. Hosted by Amanda, Kevin, Matt, and Dan. Each week we dive headfirst in the landscape of movies as we discuss movie news, play movie games, go in-depth on reviews, and even have a top ten countdown or two. Also, don't miss our director retrospective series where we review noted director's movies film by film. Bottom line is, if you love movies and love podcasts, you need to experience The Cinema Geek. You can find us on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, or GeekCastRadio.com. What was that universal greeting again? Never mind, I remember. Ba weep, grana, weep, mini bong. Hey guys, it's Rodimus Primal, and be sure to check out my YouTube channel. Join me as I have Transformers discussions, retrospectives, toy reviews, and more. You can also follow me on Twitter at Rodimus Primal, as well as Facebook and Instagram at Rodimus Primal Show. Transform and roll out, and be sure to check out my content till all are one. Last big party of the summer, folks. Let's go out with a bang. Do you like retro cartoons? Then Saturday Morning Rewind is the podcast for you. Join them each month as they talk about classic cartoons and interview legendary voice actors like Jim Cummings. I am the terror that flaps in the night. Corey Burton. <laughs> Rob Paulson. Sure, Brian, but how are we going to find chaps our size? Nancy Cartwright and many more. Eat my shorts. So grab a bowl of Lucky Charms. The magically delicious. Put on your hammer pants. Go to SaturdayMorningRewind.com. And be prepared to feel like a kid again. Once again, that's SaturdayMorningRewind.com. Saturday Morning Rewind was voted best podcast ever by its host, Tim Nidell. So it's got to be good. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Terry Smith, the host of Music Talks, the podcast where I ask guests a simple but beguiling question. Choose a song from each decade of your life and tell me why these songs mean so much to you. Guests and listeners love this format. And if you want to find out why, then take a listen at musictalkspod.buzzsprout.com or use your favorite podcast app. Just search on Music Talks Terry Smith. If you'd like to be a guest on the show and... Talk to me. Then send me a tweet at Music Talks Pod. I look forward to doing some music talking soon. Oh, hey, I got something. Since 2009, we have been the premier cartoon podcast here at the GeekCast Radio Network. We are ToonCast. From taking you beyond the cartoons we grew up with to seasonal saucy toon talk, and now we get the origins of Toonsters everywhere as we ask guests 30 questions about their cartoon watching experiences, plus so much more. Tooncast is back. Join me, TF2 and Mike, and the rest of the GCR and crew as we give you all the toon talk you will ever need, only on the GCRN. And wherever you consume your podcasts, we are beyond good, beyond evil, beyond your wildest imagination. We are all tunes all the time here on Tooncast. Yeah. Hello all sentient beings! Want the latest on everything going on in the Transformers multiverse? Check out the Transmissions Podcast Network. We've got weekly podcasts covering everything from Alpha Trion to Omega Supreme. From old school G1 all the way up to Cyberverse and beyond. And you don't want to miss Empire of Rust, the world's first and only Transformers live play role playing game podcast. If you love Transformers, there's something for everyone at TransmissionsPodcast.com. Discover a world of vintage and modern toys that's more than meets the eye with the Triple Takeover Toy Cast. Hosted by toy writers and photographers Toy Box Soapbox, 6 and TF Square One, this informal and chilled out series of discussions cover everything from vintage Transformers to Mask, Diaclone, Microman and more, be it nostalgic or current. Whether you're a seasoned collector or a casual robot enthusiast, all are welcome. Triple Takeover Toy Cast. On the Simplistic Reviews Podcast, we talk movies. We talk TV. We talk... Hello, Julie, what the heck are you doing? Trying to make our spots sound more exciting by adding explosions. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you could have got the point across with sound effects, not the real thing. Car, car. Download the show on iTunes or at simplisticreviews.blogspot.com. I'm sure your insurance company will cover that. No, they won't. No, they probably won't. You finish the paperwork, you turn the coat to property, and move on to your next case. You have a connection with the drug dealer whose place just got burnt down? Yeah. Jesus Christ. I asked you if there was any reason not to bring Claudette into this. Hey, you're the politician. Learn to read between the goddamn lines. I told you when I handled this thing myself. What does this mean for us? Just means I'll have to be careful. All right, we are back to close out The Shield Season 2 overall 20th anniversary of the program uh, celebration. And yeah, I think that's going to do it for us. Thank you for joining us here inside the studio, Studio 2009. If you'd like to get in contact with us, leave feedback for the show. There are several ways to do so. Visit the website, geekcastradio.com, where you can listen to and comment on all of our posts. You can send email to feedback at geekcastradio.com. Here are all the ways you can listen to us nowadays. Apple and Google Podcasts, leave us reviews, please. Spotify, where you can also leave us a star rating. And any other podcasting client you choose to use, follow us on Twitter at Geekcast Radio. It's for the network at It's ITS Studio 2009, all one word. For the show, I am at TF2 and Mike. What is your Twitter? At Nightbeat. Become a fan on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash geekcast radio network. You can also check out Studio 2009 podcast over there as well. Join us next time for something. I don't know what we're talking about next time. It might be season three of The Shield. I'm not sure. For now, I am TF2 and Mike with... Ryan the Even Flow. You could really mix it up and talk uh, season five for The Shield. Skip forward why, and then skip back. Why, That'd be confusing. Why do you, what? Don't do that. Don't, don't, that's, 
That's like trying to pull the the lowest log out of the bunch first. Don't do that. Uh, you'll hear us back in the studio soon. Go find Tio. I'll take care of this. Let's just call Lynn. I'll stay here and help. Did I ask for your help? If we're not careful, all roads are going to lead back to us. 